Today I'm going to be calibrating a Tascam 244 which I've got working. First part of this process is to calibrate the meters. That involves putting a sine wave into each channel, having the master fader and the channel fader set in this, see this range here in white? I always put it at the top of 8. A degree of inaccuracy there because it's analog components and you might have marginally set these at different levels. Then you want the needle to show up at the same point in the VU for all four channels. That way you know when you're introducing an input signal to the mixer that the needle is going to respond the same way. It's for the end user so they can get a predictable sense of how much tape saturation or whatever they're going to get based on what they're seeing here. There's an optional first step which is to know how many decibel volts are coming out of your function generator. Here I've got a very cheap function generator, maybe 10 quid excluding the power supply. I've got the output of that hooked up to this vintage analog meter and it shows decibel volts alongside RMS volts. So with the range set to minus 10 decibels, which is the range in which this is displaying on the Tascam 244, then I've got that signal set so it's hitting a bit minus 3. I say it's an optional step because so long as like all four meters are showing the same thing, then it doesn't actually matter that much. If I tuned all four of these so it was a minus two decibels, even minus one decibels, or minus five decibels, the, the user would have to get used to how the readings from these meters corresponded to tape saturation, distortion, etc, etc. It's a bit like if you're tuning a guitar, if the guitar's in tune with itself, it doesn't really matter whether it's a concert pitch. I've now got that open and I'll be making those adjustments using four trim pots here. Um, they're laid out in quite a weird way where that's channel 1, 2, 3, 4, even though the trim pot that corresponds to VU1 is physically furthest from it. So I've got the sine wave going into input 4 of my Tascam 244. I'm in 4 channel record mode. Gains are all turned down, the faders are all set, um, so they're at the upper part of this white region between 7 and 8. EQs are flat and uh, channels 1 and 3 are hard panned left and channels two and four are hard panned right. So you can see that's pretty far off. It's at about minus seven decibels. I want it to be at minus three. So I'll put my ceramic screwdriver into the trim pot for that channel. Turn it up till it's pointing at about minus three. And switch where that jack's going. So it's going to channel two. Basically I'm resting uh, the unit against my arm while I turn this. Let's see where we are with channel three. Set high if anything. Last of all, channel 4, also a little bit high. I now know that all four of the meters are going to respond in a similar way to a similar signal. So I can move on now to adjusting the playback levels. Next step in calibrating this 244 is to calibrate the playback levels. I've got this commercially produced test tape for setting up Dolby on a Tascam 246 from a guy from New Zealand. You can see his site there if you want to get the same one. But essentially it's sine waves at the same level at 400 hertz on all four channels. Actually the sine waves are too loud for me to be able to use the calibrated meters on the Tascam 244 itself to adjust the playback levels because it pushes, it's so loud it pushes all the meters into the red. What I can do is just send the signal from the tape out into the oscilloscope here and then I'll be using a ceramic screwdriver again, a guy like this. I'll be adjusting playback from trim pots along here. These are in groups, so these three are channel 1, these three are channel 2, these three are channel 3, and these three are channel 4. These ones in the middle of the groups are the playback EQ. I probably won't adjust them unless you know something sounds very dull or very bright. So the topmost of each group of three is the playback level. So with the tape running, I'm just going to go to the four tape outs, check that visually all of them are the same sort of amplitude, which it looks like they are. Maybe a couple of them are coming, the peaks are coming out of the screen a little bit, so I might turn them down very slightly. So you can see by turning that trim pot I pointed out earlier, I can adjust that so I'll get it so the peaks of each channel just come up to just below the top of the screen there. You can see it's not like an absolutely scientific accurate thing I'm going for here. 
And if it were, it'd be pretty difficult to do because you're turning tiny analog components with a hand tool. If somebody was a really fastidious engineer, I don't know how many decimal places of tolerance they'd be able to get scientifically measuring those output signals. I mean, there's a little bit of variance from channel to channel. Then when I come back and I can compensate for that when I come back and adjust the recording levels, which are the little square ones. Again, these are inductors, the little circular components you can see in there that's the record levels now with the playback tape still in the machine and playing back i can take any of the tape out into this frequency counter i should be getting 800 hertz you can see it's actually significantly more than that um, i've got the uh, orange pitch control wheel it's in the center so at that it should be showing 800 because it's double speed and that tape's intended for the lower speed of two speeds on a task 246 i can adjust that down in here above that pot there's a little trim pot i can put a ceramic screwdriver in there and then adjust it so that seems to be settling down now i may have some warble here because it's fluctuating a bit more than i would like to see but you can see that's roughly centered right 800 hertz This is a process which is very tedious and I would probably send you to sleep if I were to document the whole process. So I'll explain it to you. What I would do is take a freshly opened Type 2 cassette. Actually, I wouldn't use a 90 minute cassette. I've got a 60 minute cassette that I've used before that I know works pretty well. And then what I'm going to be doing is recording a continuous signal with no envelope in the amplitude. Just an oscillator from a synth or a signal generator, anything like that where the sound isn't going to vary the amount of voltage that's coming through the system and ending up on the tape over time. A consistent and identical signal will be recorded to all four channels. What I'm looking for is if I record this signal at minus three decibels, when I play the signal back then I want it to also read at minus three decibels on these meters. The assumption here is that because I've already calibrated meters and calibrated the playback levels, the difference between the signal going in and the signal out, it gives me some indicator of how much amplification the record amplifiers are are providing to the cassette. Let's say that I record all of them at minus three decibels and when they play back they all play back at minus three decibels except two which is at minus seven. At that point I would flip the machine over. These controls here are for the record and the round ones as opposed to the square ones, the square ones with a little magnet in the middle, those are inductors, but it's these variable resistors above. That's channel one, two, three, four. So if I'm adjusting channel three, if you think that turning that way clockwise tightens a screw, that's equivalent to turning the signal up. So if it's too low, then I would get a ceramic screwdriver like this into that and turn it. And then I just make the recording again and see where I am. So maybe I've done it again and this time it's too loud. That one's playing back at minus one decibels when I recorded it at minus three. So then I'd go back, flip this over, turn that down a little bit, i.e. anti-clockwise, like you're loosening a screw. And and it's just an iterative process like that and doing all four channels you know it can take about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to do to get it right because it is such a kind of hit or miss process where you're kind of judging almost by feel how much to turn it each way and you're sort of like too high too low too high too low circling in on your prey trying to get a good value you're not necessarily going to get it bang on so you know you might end up with playback levels that are about a decibel too high or a decibel too low compared to the the size of the input signal that's okay. As long as I can get all four channels so that the signal that plays back is within one decibel of what I put in, then I, I'm satisfied that if I'm going to use this machine myself or whoever the person is I might be selling this to is going to be able to reliably judge based on what they're looking at on the meters, know how much tape saturation, how much volume they're getting back from the tape when they record something. It's some time later. I've done about five or six passes of making minus three decibel input signal recordings along the four channels using this Korg Mini synth. You can see that all four of the meters are playing back approximately minus three. And that one's very slightly under, that one's very slightly over, but it's really within a decibel. So at that point, I am satisfied that the meters playback levels and record levels are calibrated in such a way that the end user is going to be able to make intelligent assessments of how saturated or quiet the recording is going to be based on what they're seeing in the meters. 
And one final thing you might want to do to just check that all the work that you've put into the refurbishment of the transport is paid off in terms of low, wow and flutter is to record a song into two channels from a sound source like just the MP3 player on a phone. It doesn't have to be particularly high quality. You can use something like this out the headphone jack. So this is a stereo 3.5 inch jack into RCA and I've got adapters for quarter inch into channels one and two. You want to pick a song one that has a lot of decay of symbols in it. I find that for my ear, I'm much more likely to notice um, a problem with wear or flutter when I'm listening to the decay of symbols. So to that end, the, the song that I use is Riding Bikes by Shellac. There's a lot of points there where the guitar and bass cut out and drummers just going and sometimes let the crash symbols decay. And so if I were to have a problem with transport, it'd be very obvious to me, having made a recording here, that something is not right. This machine I'm about to sell on eBay, it actually turns out it did have that problem. Um, I've now put a different transport in there. I've got a transport here where I did everything I should have done, you know, like, I mean, I lubricated the motor, I had all new rubber parts. You can see there's new idler tires in there. I won't go into why the, I've taken the heads off this. But basically, there's still quite a subtle wow to it. So far as I can tell, it's just that this particular capstan motor has got more hours on it than some units that come into my possession. Um, I am going to hang on to this. You can see I've labelled subtle warble. The reason being, if you're um, like me, kind of a fan of what, what people like Pineback and um, Amulets do, or you're kind of using cassette to degrade and warm up the sound in a creative way, then this was actually sounding pretty good. I quite liked what it was doing to the sound, but I can't really sell it like that so at some point when i've got you know quite a junky 244 in with you know maybe it's got a messed up case makes it harder to sell um i'll keep that for myself and put this in it you know anytime i intentionally want to exploit those aspects what a slightly sick cassette multi-track recorder can do to your sound then i will use that unit instead of uh, my usual one which is in pretty good condition having done that test and run through the all the sorts of tests that i did um, when i was showing you the test of a uh, 44 mark 3 where you know you're just checking all the pans and EQs don't rustle too much linking up effects to the auxiliary send and return everything's working then you can use it yourself or, or sell it on or whatever it is you're going to do